Hello, I'm Erica Clark. I'm a 4-H educator from Shenango County. As part of our 4-H virtual mammal series, we wanted to have a talk with a biologist. So we have Scott Smith from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and he is a fur bearer biologist, and he's here today to talk to us about the different research and surveys going on in New York State, and we will learn about what a fur bearer is. We're going to talk about fur bearer management in New York and, and uh, kind of a sort of an unusual thing, something most people don't even think about. You know, we're thinking, you know, wildlife management, your folks are thinking deer, bear, moose, you know, the, the big glorious stuff. Uh, but there's a whole uh, other whole other realm out there that the DEC um, deals with. So let's, uh, let's see if I can come on now. There we go. Okay. So, um, as a, a group of for the fur bearers, we actually have um, uh, fifteen different species that we primarily deal with uh, that we refer to as fur bearers. Um, so, just just for fun here, I'm just going to go kind of go across the top row here. We got muskrats, we got gray fox, we have an opossum, we got a beaver. Then the second row, we got a uh, long tail weasel, a short tail weasel, a mink, a red fox, and a skunk. Then dropping down, we have a marten, the uh, raccoon, a fisher. Uh, in the bottom row, we got coyotes, river otter, and bobcat. And there actually is one more that's the least weasel, um, which is this little tiny, minuscule little critter that does exist in New York. But uh, it's so very difficult to, to detect that uh, um, we only have like you know three or four confirmed sightings in in New York um, historically. But they are here. Just that uh, you know, if one gets hit by a car or something like that, it just ends up as a paste and just is not identifiable. So uh, anyway, so that that's the. The group of critters that I'm talking about, when I'm referring to fur bearers, so it's basically any animal that, that historically has had there's a fur val a value, um, dollar value associated with the, with its pelt uh, or its fur. So uh, that's the the group of animals that we're talking about here. And um, you know, one of the, the you know, so why why we need fur bearer biologists? Because well, people just don't know what a fur bearer is and uh, uh, in a lot of cases and, and it's amazing how many mis IDs we do get um, <clears throat> you know people calling a mink river otter or they're calling muskrats beaver or you know it just the list just goes on and on that people's knowledge really is pretty limited uh, what on the on these, these this group of species so so some of the, the um, uh, things I'm gonna kind of cover today, uh, the, the current projects that, that we're actively involved in, uh, dealing with uh, river otter. Uh, we have a study going on with Fisher. We have a study going on with Bobcat numbers. Uh, uh, really pretty uh, intensive study going on in the, in the Adirondacks on the makeup of Fisher populations and their dynamics. There's something weird going on there right now. We don't fully understand. Uh, basic overall health assessments of, of these critters and, and analyzing, you know, because they, these animals are harvested and, and some of them in, in fairly high numbers, uh, making sure that those populations are sound and, and <clears throat> taking a look at the data that we collect from that information. So starting out with, with river otter, <clears throat> it's our, uh, our largest mustelid uh, member of the weasel family that we have in New York. And uh, uh, kind of quick history that <clears throat> we used to have river otter completely across the state. And by the uh, early mid 1900s, they pretty much had been eliminated from the western half of the state. It primarily due to water quality issues and habitat loss that uh, 
you know, everything that was farmable was stripped. The we had, uh, um, you know, people were draining wetlands. They were, um, you know, dumping all kinds of toxic stuff in into the water systems, and it just was no longer um, suitable habitat for otter anymore. They are pretty sensitive species to to habitat loss and to uh, contaminants, uh, but they did maintain a, a stronghold in the Adirondacks and in, in the, the Hudson Valley and Catskills. Uh, and um, during the um, uh, late 1990s, um, uh, the beginning of my career, and I was involved in, uh, I was down in the Hudson Valley at the time and was involved in the, the acquisition end of of we had uh, uh, trappers catch otter for us and we paid them for the live animal and we shipped them out to western new york to the new york river otter project and let them go and so we ended up moving 279 otter from the primarily out of the the adirondacks but some out of the catskills hudson valley uh into the the western part of the state and let them go and uh um so they're not an easy animal to count uh, just because they the habitat that they're in just is not conductive to to easy going now let me see there's one out of there there's one over here it just doesn't work that way uh, so uh, we finally have, have developed some techniques using uh, a survey in the winter time where I'm so sorry I, we, the fee is Show my video. Where we go out and uh, uh, look for otter sign. All right, so the fee is five hundred. <laughs> so, yeah, so go out in the wintertime, look for otter sign, and you know, look for tracks. Um, they've a um, uh, looking for for scat or droppings, which uh, actually I prefer to look look for those. They persist a lot longer on the landscape than a track does. Um, so th this is one of the, we're out doing this right now, um, all across this, across the state, going out looking for, for otter sign. And then we put that into some modeling and, and come up with, uh, um, some indices. So uh, this kind of look, looking at just the, we did this also up north, but in the, um, southern, the southern zone of New York. Uh, you know, all the black dots there, those are all the places we went and looked, which is a lot. And all the uh, yellow dots is where we detected otter. Um, now that doesn't mean that those black dots did not have otter. It just means we did not see any tracks or sign when we were there. Uh, but most likely at some point in time, an otter will come through there. It just, you know, the odds of, of finding that animal when it's there and left sign uh, is pretty low. Um, so using, you know, some modeling, um, playing with the numbers, you can make an estimate of how many of those spots that we did not find otter at actually have otter. So, uh, and then looking at the habitat features and why, you know, otter are more likely to be found in certain locations than others, uh, we can come up with with some more uh, 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 representative mapping of what the otter population looks like across the state. And you know, we were really kind of you know, since we really didn't have much data on on what was going out out here in in Western New York. Here, you know, we had had actual we do have a otter trapping season and and the Adirondacks and in the um, um, Catskills, Hudson Valley. So we, we have some really solid information there. And what we found is that basically across the, the, the southern half of New York, that otter populations are pretty uniform. Uh, you know, the, the, the lake plain up here uh, is less than, than down here. And that's simply a factor of all the intense ag that's going on up here. Um, the, the, not as many wetlands, um, just the 
fact of, of what the current landscape looks like, but there are otter there and they're doing well. And certainly there are pockets, you know, like the, the Montezuma complex over here is really good. I mean, if, if you look at that area specifically, it looks almost like the, the Adirondacks. Uh, the same with the Oak Orchard Tanawanda complex out here. Uh, but as a whole on that landscape, it, you, you kind of got to average it out. But basically what we found is that river otter are, are doing pretty, pretty well. Uh, so it, we did this. Um, back a couple of years ago and we've come around, we're doing it again, just to just to double check and, and see if there's been any change, which we really don't expect. Uh, and then at that point, we'll make some decisions and move forward with management of river otter um, across the state. So uh, kind of a similar base thing, you know, Fisher, um, you know, we had them in, in the Adirondacks. We did um, move a few down to the Catskills in the in the 80s, uh, and they took off down there. The western, central western part of the state, um, we were getting a population of fisher that has moved up from Pennsylvania when they did a restoration of this native animal. Uh, and again, you know, this is a native critter, was native to all of New York. Uh, it, uh, at one point and was pretty much confined to to the the Adirondacks for for um, for a lot of the same reasons that river otter were just that that habitat loss you know when you you go from being uh, uh, you know 80 percent forested to being 20 percent forested that just takes away where these animals live uh, but that habitat has come back you know, we're, we're now 60% forested on average across New York. And, and as that, that um, habitat has come back, these critters are coming back with it. Uh, so we knew we had some fisher out there, but we really didn't have a good handle on, on what was going on, where they really were distributed. And so, you know, starting back in, in 2013, we started throwing out some cameras on a, a piece of a hunk of beaver. We worked with trappers and, and uh, got the carcasses from them, hacked them up, uh, wrapped it in wire, stuck it to a tree, and uh, set a camera, a trail camera on it. And we really were kind of, uh, you know, here's our, our, our setup, a hunk of beaver meat, a camera on a adjoining tree, and uh, um, let the fisher come to us. We've put some uh, a pretty stinky lure uh, which is real heavily skunk based um, which we actually refer to as our, our in the office here is our COVID test kit if you can't smell the lure when you come into the wildlife office you have COVID and are then borrowed from the building um, because yeah we our, uh, our end of the wing did uh, uh, stink for quite a while down here it's just you, you got to be able to deal with this stuff. Um, so we put these cameras out and what we found was, holy crap, we got Fisher. Um, and uh, they're pretty much everywhere in upstate New York at this point. Uh, they are at higher densities and, you know, the farther, you, farther south you go along the Pennsylvania line, and it does taper out as you get up in the Lake Plains, but they exist. You know, we have we have Fisher in Niagara County, you know, all uh, Monroe County, you know, all the way to the Pennsylvania line and east and west uh, as well. Uh, so this is an animal that uh, pretty much on its own with not a whole lot of help from us has reclaimed uh, where, it, where it once was. Uh, so using, um, this information, uh, you know, and we're also, and you're wondering, maybe wondering what, what these little strips are around that hunk of meat. Uh, those are gun brushes. Uh, those are 30 caliber gun brushes. And what that does is as that Fisher times up, tries to get that bait, it'll rub up against that brush and that will pull some hair out of it. And from that, we can look at DNA and identify that to an individual and kind of get a, a what we call it a mark recapture if we get, if we get that Fisher in the same spot or a different spot. We know it's the same animal. We can use that in our modeling to, to come up with um, 
the number of animals we have on the landscape. So again, you know, using that modeling, you know, the, the darker uh, green you get, the higher the probability that, that fisher are there and the redder you get, the less likely that Fisher there. Uh, although, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I've picked up roadkill fisher right up in in the city limits of Rochester. So uh, they are there just at, at a much, much lower density. Um, so you can kind of see the, the distribution and, and uh, uh, that we have of, of fisher currently. And so we did that from uh, 13 to 16, and then we just wrapped up another three years of that last year. Uh, and we're still doing the modeling right now of all that data that we collected. Um, and th this actually was the, um, um, we had like 600 and some uh, camera sites across the state that we did this at. And um, when we did this back in 20, I don't, this probably has changed, but it, when we did this in 2013 to 2016, this was the largest camera trap study done anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, it took a lot of effort, a lot of miles uh, for us to run these cameras, um, but it it pulled up, it gave us some really, really good information and, and uh, uh, it's been, been really, really helpful. So now we're, we're looking to do a very similar thing with Bobcats coming up and we're gonna be doing a, a, a a very um, starting this spring, uh, trying some techniques to to get a count on bobcats because they're another critter that uh, even though you're looking right at them, you don't see them. Uh, they're there, but trying to count these things is is almost impossible. Uh, so some work that um, was done down in West Virginia uh, showed that. Uh, they can get a pretty good estimate of their population using these these blue cubbies. It's a uh, um, it's actually uh, uh, can't see it from this angle. It's actually hollow in the middle, um, and you put some lure and bait down in the middle of that. We also have those gun brushes on the side so that when that bobcat walks through that, it'll pull some hair, and you know, we can put a set of a camera on it. And actually that color blue is uh, a color that is actually attractive to bobcats. That, that is uh, one of the most visible colors out in nature because it doesn't, uh, what's blue out in nature? Not much. Uh, so it's a very high contrasting color and we'll get a bobcat's attention. They'll come and check it out. So, you know, just knowing little things like that can make a huge difference in, in how a lot of these studies go. You know, instead of using green or, um, you know, black or whatever, just changing your color can, can uh, make a big, big influence on, on your success. So we're hoping to do a lot of the same modeling with bobcats as bobcat populations. Again, we have bobcats, you know, when, when I started uh, my job 30 years ago, you know, we had bobcats in the in the Adirondacks. We had them in the Catskills, uh, in the Taconics, uh, and there were a few scattered out in the the um, you know the uh, western Catskills. Uh, but that those numbers have really taken off. And again, the same thing with Fisher, Pennsylvania's bobcat population took off as well. Again, as these forests return, these forest animals are coming back with it. And, you know, we certainly we started noticing uh, more, more and more bobcats. Uh, the people were observing along the, the Pennsylvania line and, and uh, uh, we started doing more um, surveys ourselves, requesting help from the public to, when they did see a bobcat, let us know. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, so now we're, which is because of that, that, um, issue with Miss ID, uh, you know, using uh, observations that don't have a photo with them uh, are, are really suspect. So, you know, using a technique 
technique like this that we can consistently apply across the landscape can really help us understand what's going on with that bobcat population. Uh, but yeah, we currently have bobcats all the way across Western New York. There's no place uh, in, you know, outside of Long Island that would surprise me at all that somebody saw a bobcat. Uh, now we get into the into the blood and guts and gore, and you know if you're ever thinking about becoming a wildlife biologist, this is a pretty important part of what we do. It's not all cute and fuzzy. Um, you know, in order to know what's going on with these critters, we need to get inside them sometimes and uh, cutting them up and figuring out what what their uh, um, <clears throat> what's going on with them is is really important. So we occasionally have some necropsy sessions where we take these things and cut them up and collect different parts. And then uh, um, we're not smart enough ourselves to actually do a lot of the analysis on them. Uh, so we'd say we have uh, pathologists that we work with that uh, will take those pieces and parts and, and figure out what's going on. And one of the um, interesting things that uh, well, working with uh, our counterparts over at Cornell University, uh, they just kind of, ran, you know, we had them all these samples, they took a whole bunch of liver samples and just random, um, took 15 animals that were uh, fisher and sent them out for rodenticide testing. Now, rodenticide is rat poison, mouse and rat poison. Uh, so, you know, it's what people, decon or what people put uh, in, their, um, in their garages or whatever to try and keep the mice down. Um, so what uh, um, came back was very, very eye-opening to us that out of these 15 animals, 12 of them had been exposed to rodenticide, had been exposed to rat poison. So how did they, how, first question is, how did they get it? Well, I wouldn't put it past the fisher to eat a, a bait block of, of rodenticide directly. But more likely, uh, when a, a mouse or rat eats, um, or a chipmunk or a squirrel eats this bait, they don't die immediately. It takes a couple days. So they may get this uh, inside a building, but then they they go outside. They're compromised. They're not as fast. They're you know they're uh, and they're just easier prey for a predator like a fisher or a fox or a coyote or, you know, uh, a hawk or, or whatever. Uh, so then that animal consumes them and is then poisoned by the, the uh, um, that, was by, that was intended for, for the rodent. So pretty high, you know, when you got 12 out of 15, it's like uh, maybe there's something going on here. And when you looked at the different types of uh, rodenticides that are out there. And several of these animals had multiple exposures to different types. Uh, uh, kind of means this, this is a pretty systemic problem. Uh, so we, we uh, shared that information with other states in the, in the Northeast and uh, have done some more expansive testing. And if you just look at, uh, you know, in Maine, um, 50, 55% of their fish are tested positive. Uh, in uh, New Hampshire, 100% of the red fox tested positive, 100% of their gray fox, 93% uh, of their fisher. Uh, Vermont, 100% of their fisher. Uh, New York, 70, uh, 78%, 79% of our fisher have tested positive. Uh, um, Pennsylvania, 23% uh, of their bobcats, 74% of their fisher. And here's an interesting one, 12% of river otter uh, have been exposed to rat poison. So, you know, this is just kind of a, a brand new thing. Does this really meet, you know, the question now is, is this actually having an impact on the health of these populations as a whole or not? And the, we don't know the answer to that. So we're, we're looking at uh, doing some more uh, research to look into this to see uh, how how important this discovery is you know but this is one of the things if we hadn't cut up those critters we never would have known this uh, and 
you know, it's, it's kind of the, the death by multiple cuts. You throw this on top of all the new tick diseases out there, uh, all the, the, um, uh, the different tick viruses and, and bacteria that uh, every time the animal gets something like this, it's suppressing their immune system. And you keep adding all these different suppressors on their system. Eventually, they give up. So, um, you know, trying to figure out all these little pieces of the puzzle is, is an important thing. So in the uh, switching topics, a little bit coming back to, to um, out in the field studies, you know, here we got a, a uh, female fisher uh, with, a, with a radio collar that we've put on her and she's carrying one of her young. And if you notice, we have another camera over here and the camera that took the picture. Uh, basically what we do is we use these, these collar, these female fisher, follow them around until they go have uh, their den and have their little ones in, in the spring, which is often 40, 50 feet up a tree in a little hollow. And uh, uh, since we, it's really difficult to get up into that tree and, and see how many little ones she had. What we do is we basically surround the area with cameras and she will move those little ones every, uh, every couple of weeks. So when she goes to move them, uh, we catch her on camera and get a count of how many little ones she had. And so the next time she goes to another den and she moves them again, if she loses one or two, we can document that and get an idea of survival rates on uh, these young fisher. So the, um, the, the fisher population in the central Adirondacks is giving us a little bit of concern right now. They're just not doing as well as we think they should be doing. So this is one of the things we're looking at to see if there's something going on. Uh, with the with the reproductive potential of of, of Fisher in that in that location, uh, so uh, with our our trapping and hunting season on a lot of these species, you know, figuring out what's going on with those populations based on uh, um, that harvest. You know, there's a lot of things we can do. Just having a, a rough count of or an exact count on a lot of these fur bearers uh, of how many are taken helps us tremendously but there's other things we can do if we collect a lower jaw uh we can take one of these teeth and on this is a fisher jaw and actually the tooth we want is the, this tooth right here uh, which is the fourth premolar we pop that tooth out and we can section it like a tree and count the rings and come up with the age of how old that fisher was uh, and uh, we can do the same with bobcat. We can do the same with river otter. We can do the same with, with any, you know, any of the, the species uh, to give us an age structure uh, of those critters. Uh, and while we're also, uh, when we're cutting these critters up, we're pulling rep other reproductive fracks. Uh, down at the bottom here, uh, this is actually a muskrat. And, um, reproductive tract and every one of these black dots is where she had a little one the previous year or two so you can count um, how many little ones she had and, and know what the reproductive rate is so piece in the the age structure and the reproductive potential together it helps us keep an eye on making sure that that uh, we're not over harvesting or if we're under harvesting we need to you know uh, maybe make a season longer or make a season shorter, depending on what, what we need to do. Um, you know, so, you know, just looking at the uh, uh, age um, structure, I know this graph doesn't mean anything to anybody, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if the growth, lambda is the growth potential of that population. If it's greater than one, your population's growing. If it's less than that, you know, it's all based on, on your age structure. Uh, if you're, uh, value is less than one, your population's declining. So there, there's a lot of statistics, a lot of math that goes into all this um, to help us know what, what's going on with the wildlife out there. Uh, here's muskrats, uh, age and uh, um, uh, sex ratios in the harvest. Uh, you know, it, and it's, it's not just knowing the behavior of some of these critters, why, you know, muskrats are born at a, a one to one male to female ratio. But uh, there's a considerably higher portion of males that are captured than females. Well, 
males travel a little bit farther. It makes them more susceptible to being caught. So just knowing that, you know, if you look at that without knowing that, you, you might get a little upset and, and concerned. Um, but really, you know, knowing their behaviors or whatever, you can you can sort some of this stuff out. So, all right, that's the, the quick and dirty of what we're doing with wildlife and fur bear management in New York State at the moment. So I'll open it up to if you guys got any questions or not. So. I have a question for you, Scott. Going sure. back to the rodenticide um, percentage in the fishers, mm -hmm. um, there was a higher pop, you know, you had some for Allegheny County and Livingston County. And um, I was curious to know if the fishers were taken at the state parks. To that first sample that we put out, the bulk of those were um, road kills, okay. just kind of random road kills. Uh, um, our larger sample that kind of popped up in the, the next slide, that's when we, you know, we were collecting carcasses from um, trapper harvested critters. Also, the otter survey, um, we kind of put out a thing. We saw that you were looking for the public to send in pictures mm -hmm. if they mm -hmm. see signs of otter. Um, will you? How will you use that information? So th that uh, it's it's you know, we we asked the public to report not just otter, but uh, otter, bobcat, fisher, weasels, uh, and actually snowshoe hare at the moment because we were, have some questions on snowshoe hare. Um, and so that that's kind of a, 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 a harvest independent data source for us. So it's not not based on, you know, things can get biased sometimes if you're just looking at harvest based data. Uh, so that that's a, a, a it's uh, inexpensive for us to collect that data, you know, just people call in or they send us an email, whatever, it's, that's cheap. And then we compile all that and look at that on the landscape scale. And it can, it can give you an idea of, of what's going on in the landscape and where we need to focus some, other, some more of our surveys. Scott, I've got another question thinking of the kids that are going to be watching this. What is the most interesting animal that you have gotten pictures of on these bait sites? Oh boy, uh, we have gotten pictures of almost everything um, from, uh, you know, Cooper's hawks, to red shouldered hawks, uh, owls. Uh, it's amazing how many uh, flying squirrels are attracted to meat. Uh, flying squirrels, they love that hunk of, hunk of beaver and uh, we get all kinds of pictures of flying squirrels. Uh, I also didn't know that skunks could climb. We've got pictures of skunks actually climbing the trees to, to get to the bait. Yeah, we've gotten everything from black bears and moose, you know, the largest mammals in New York State, down to uh, shrews.